Hello, this is a program, Be Healthy, and I'm the host, Dr. Vladimir Levitin. Today in our studio, we have a very special guest, Dr. Michael Fellings, a professor of University of Toronto in neurosurgery, a recipient of uh, Oliver Krona Award from Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and Halbert Chair in uh, neuro repair and and regeneration. Excellent. Well, and this is only a part of all your titles. So uh, you've done a great service to the society and your main area of expertise or interest, I would say, is the spinal cord injury. Yes, that's well, correct. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about spinal cord injury because uh, it sounds extremely tragic and devastating to anybody who hears about people who suffer the spinal cord injury. So the spinal cord is a critical structure that connects the brain to the rest of the body. And so all of the nerve signals that um, go from the brain to the body travel through the spinal cord and then also all of the uh, sensory input, the feelings, touch, pain, etc., pressure, go up through the spinal cord to the brain. So when the spinal cord is damaged, it can literally uh, affect almost all aspects of the human uh, condition. Spinal cord injury can be thought of broadly as being in two forms. So one is a traumatic injury, and that's perhaps the form that people are most aware of because the impact is quite dramatic. If you think of, for example, Christopher Reeve, the Superman, when he had this tragic high cervical injury. When he fell off the horse. Exactly, when he had this equestrian accident. But the majority of uh, spinal cord injuries are more subtle. And the most common form of injury to the spinal cord relates to degenerative disc disease. We call this degenerative cervical myelopathy. So degenerative because the discs are degenerating, cervical because it's in the neck, and myelopathy because it's a condition of the spinal cord. And degenerative cervical myelopathy is the most common cause of spinal cord impairment in the world. And if you look at the full spectrum of spinal cord injury, it's actually a very common condition. Uh, everybody has degenerative disc disease after the certain age. Uh, why are some people, why do some people develop uh, myelopathy and some people don't? Yeah, so that's a, it's a, that's a great question. We have some of the answers to this and some aspects of this we're continuing to research. The discs are remarkable structures that allow for stability of the spine, but at the same time, they allow for movement of the spine. But it's that uh, remarkable aspect of, of, of nature's engineering that renders the discs vulnerable to degeneration. Degeneration of the disc is part of the aging process, and once uh, uh, people um, uh, become older, the discs start to degenerate. And in most uh, people, there aren't a lot of symptoms that occur related to this. But some individuals will develop problems either related to pain on a nerve or uh, due to pressure on the spinal cord. In some cases, there may be um, a disruption of the disc and some of the jelly-like material may push out and that may cause pressure on, uh, on, the, on the nerve and people have nerve pain. But in other cases, the degeneration is more subtle and occurs over time. So some people have a narrowing of the spinal canal. We call that a congenital narrowing. So they, people are born with a narrower spinal canal. And so when there's degeneration of the discs, they're more vulnerable to developing pressure on the spinal cord. In some people, the genetics are such that they will develop more uh, advanced degeneration of the discs, not necessarily occurring very late in life, 
but earlier in life or in the middle years of life. So there's, some, a, there's a genetic predisposition to this. And then also pressure on the spinal cord tissue alone does not always result in symptoms. Of course, if there's severe pressure, yes, it, it will in almost everyone. But some patients have lesser degrees of pressure, but have a lot of symptoms and other people don't. And what we're recognizing is that there are genetic factors that uh, render people more susceptible to um, the impact of this. Much like we're recognizing that certain people have genetic predisposition to getting concussions and post-concussion issues, we recognize that potentially similar factors render people more vulnerable to the impact of spinal cord compression. So people who have marked changes on the MRI, uh, but don't have symptoms, and some people have mild changes on the MRI, but significant symptoms of myelopathy. Uh, so there is no uh, objective uh, finding that can correlate uh, to the severity or chances of developing myelopathy? Well, the MRI is a very valuable tool. Um, at the extremes, so if a normal MRI, you can pretty much be sure the patient won't have much in the way of symptoms. If there's a very severe degree of compression, it's very likely the patient would have symptoms. It would be surprising. What becomes more challenging is when the amount of compression is moderate. Uh, it's sometimes hard to know. So the MRI is showing indentation there of may the be spinal indent cord. Exactly. There may be mild pressure on the spinal cord. Some patients will go on to develop progressive problems. Others won't. What is important is that people need to be more aware of what symptoms to watch out for. What are those symptoms? The most common presentation initially will be neck pain. Mm -hmm. The important thing for people and for their doctors and healthcare practitioners to be aware of is not just that they have the neck pain, but they need to uh, be aware of potential symptoms and signs of myelopathy or spinal cord compression. These include problems with walking. Your walking is starting to become unstable. Perhaps when you go up and down the stairs, you're not as stable as you used to be. You need to hang on to a handrail. You notice that your walking is a bit clumsier, and sometimes people attribute this to old age, but you need to be careful about that assumption. And we're talking about cervical myelopathy. We're talking about cervical myelopathy in the neck. The second uh, most common symptom is a problem with hand function. And particularly if it's in both hands, mm -hmm. Be careful about not attributing this to carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, that's often a common error that people make. Usually carpal tunnel syndrome won't be bilateral. And particularly if you have sensory problems, so numbness, tingling in the hands, or problems with the hand function. So if you have the combination of problems with walking, some hand issues, and neck pain, you very likely have cervical myelopathy. Would nerve conduction test or EMG show uh, the effect? The nerve conduction tests will not show the effect on, on the cervical cord. We use those sometimes to rule out significant peripheral nerve issues. Occasionally, if people have uh, referred pain in the arm, we may pick up some changes on the EMGs. But a negative EMG does not exclude the diagnosis of cervical myelopathy. And first, on the positive EMG, you'll get the sensory loss and then motor loss in case of myelopathy, or it's uh, at the same time? Yeah, so um, uh, the most uh, initial symptoms that people have will be changes in the feeling. And that may not be picked up. Uh, on EMGs or nerve conduction tests. If people are starting to get significant pressure on the spinal cord that's either affecting a nerve that's exiting from the spine or the nerve cells in the spinal cord that control movement, you will see changes on the EMGs. So we do use EMGs as a diagnostic tool, 
but it's just one part of the data set. The most important uh, thing that we pay attention to is the, uh, the history and the physical examination. Uh, so what are you looking for at, while you're doing physical examination? So uh, in the physical examination, we will ask people to stand and to walk. And we'll look very carefully at the walking. Um, and um, normally, people should be able to walk quite briskly with a narrow stance. That, that means that your feet are not very wide apart. You're quite stable with the walking. You can walk with a, a normal speed. Sometimes we'll ask people to walk heel to toe. And we do this to try to bring out subtle signs of problems. And so if people have a lot of difficulty with this, we become concerned that there can be a spinal cord problem. Then we test muscle strength. We will look for feeling. We'll test this with a pin and often with a Kleenex uh, to look for a light touch. And then we'll test the reflexes. Um, and if the reflexes are very increased, then we become concerned that there may be a, a spinal cord problem. Uh, the sensory loss and dysesthesia, uh, does it affect a, a person in dermatomal pattern or more in the sclerotomal pattern? Right. So the dermatomes and the sclerotomes refer to the distribution all along the skin of a particular nerve. And the sclerotomes refer to um, it includes the, the distribution of the, mu of, the, of, the, of, the, of the muscles. And so it depends partly on whether you're looking mainly at a nerve issue, in which case you will see a, a loss of feeling or sensation in the distribution of that nerve. So for example, if it's the C6 nerve, Typically, it'll be the thumb mm -hmm. and along the radial aspect of the forearm. If it's involving the spinal cord itself, it may not have as clear a dermatomal pattern, but one of the clues is that it's bilateral, that is on both sides. And so um, this can sometimes be a bit tricky for the general practitioner to sort out. But the important thing for uh, the general practitioner to be aware of is just to think about the diagnosis. And so when a patient comes into the office of the family doctor or the healthcare practitioner, you hear neck pain, you think, okay, I better screen for cervical myelopathy. Test the walking, look at the muscle strength, look at the feeling, look at the hand function. And if things are starting to add up, that there are several things that, that, are, that are off, you need to be aware of the diagnosis of cervical myelopathy, and then an MRI will be helpful. If a person is diagnosed with the cervical myelopathy, what is the course of action? Right, so it partly depends on the impact of the cervical myelopathy on the individual. So if the changes are very mild and it's very subtle, and the, the person may not be aware of this, but the doctor has picked this up. In those cases, we often will recommend um, careful watching, perhaps physical therapy, and then repeated examinations. But once the symptoms reach the point where people are having neurological impairment, like their walking is off, the hand function is off, if, this, if there is significant pressure on the spinal cord, we then recommend surgical management. Such as laminectomies, discotomies, etc. Yes, what, what is done is uh, we re remove the pressure off the spinal cord, and then in many cases, we also need to reconstruct uh, the, the spinal cord, or the spine, rather. Uh, and we can do this either through an anterior approach where we will remove the discs and then we replace the discs with a material to stabilize the spine. Or in some cases, uh, the pressure may be more severe from the back. And there we uh, will release the pressure from the back and that's referred to as a laminectomy. Or sometimes we open the canal with a procedure called a 
laminoplasty, and, and it will partly depend on the on the pattern of compression in terms of what type of procedure the surgeon will recommend. Do you fuse the spine? We often will because um, in many cases, the degeneration of the discs has resulted in instability, and sometimes the spine is showing evidence of uh, deformity or subluxation. And so what we will do is we'll stabilize that component of the spine to protect the spine and the spinal cord. And in most cases, patients still retain a very good range of movement. It's only when the fusions are very extensive that people start noticing some reduction in, in range of uh, motion. Uh, what is the uh, possibility of not a positive outcome after the surgery, like scar formation, failed spinal surgery? So fortunately, the, the likeliest outcome after this type of surgery is that people are quite happy with the outcome. So in the vast majority of cases, we can stabilize the level of functioning, which is the first goal, because patients typically will deteriorate. In about 80% of cases, people will notice an improvement in the function. Is it better to do it earlier or later? And is there a critical point where it's too late to do it? Right. It, it is better to do it or to do the surgery earlier. You don't want to wait um, to the point where there's so much damage to the spinal cord that people um, will have a suboptimal outcome. So this is where the art of medicine comes in. So if patients are very mild and very early, it may be better to watch the patient and see where they are, are going. I start worrying about patients when they slip from the mild situation to where it's moderate. If you intervene at that point, you can get an excellent result for the patient. They'll be very happy. They will feel extremely well. If you wait to the point where people are very severely impaired, say they're coming in with a walker or even a wheelchair, you can get improvement and sometimes a lot of improvement, but sometimes the amount of improvement is only, is only smaller and, and patients have residual impairment. So I would say that I would almost never turn a patient down and say you're too severe to, to mm -hmm. try. I would always try, but the optimal situation is where a patient still have excellent functioning but it's clear that they're starting to deteriorate. Um, is it an episodic uh, problem or it's continuous? Because some people will have the numbness and then it goes away, then it starts again. Is it ebbs and flows or it's con continuous decline? About um, a third of patients will uh, show a picture of continuous decline. Mm -hmm about a third of patients will show a picture of where it's episodic. Um, and then um, about a third of, uh, of patients don't progress. So um, the patients that are showing continued deterioration are the ones that I really worry about because those patients you need to intervene earlier because you will miss the window uh, when the surgery will be, be will be beneficial. Um, there are some patients where they have mild symptoms and they just don't progress. And so you can watch those patients uh, carefully. The other patients that are a bit tricky are the ones that are episodic. So sometimes what occurs is the patients think they get back to the baseline, but they actually don't. So in fact, they're having a stepwise deterioration. So they deteriorate, then they, they stabilize, they get used to the new norm. They deteriorate a bit, they stabilize. And sometimes they don't even notice it. The patients don't notice it until they start having quite severe uh, symptoms. So in those patients, um, this is where uh, the healthcare practitioner can provide advice and to indicate that objectively there are changes that are occurring. And you need to then uh, counsel the patient that if they continue to watch this, they're going to reach a point 
where it'll have a big impact on their quality of life. You were saying that it's a compression. Is it only physical compression of the spinal cord or let's say such findings as hypertrophy of ligamentum flavum uh, also compromise the ner physically compromise the canal and plus let's say uh, disc protrusion which results in the release of the sequestered protein causes inflammatory reaction in the spinal cord? There are three factors that contribute to the development of uh, symptoms in degenerative cervical myelopathy or compression on the spinal cord that results in symptoms. The first is the compression itself. That will cause problems. And the compression itself can reduce the blood supply in the spinal cord and there are changes that can occur in the spinal cord as a result of this. The second component is what we call the dynamic component. So the spine moves. When you do an MRI, you're taking a picture of the spinal cord with the individual lying back. What you need, one needs to realize is that if there's instability in the spine, that there can be a dynamic component to the problem. Can the, you pick it up at the uh, flexion extension MRI, dynamic MRIs like Fonar? Yes, yeah, so you can pick it up um, even on a simpler test. So even just with x-rays, with the patient going flexion back and extension forth. Flexion extension studies. With flexion extension studies on the x-rays. Um, flexion extension MRIs, uh, we would generally only use in very special circumstances to where the findings are more subtle. The third type of, of factor that will result in symptoms are more subtle because you can't see them on, on the MRI, but these are the molecular changes that are occurring within the spinal cord. And um, uh, you had, had alluded to some of these. Uh, so one of the critical factors is inflammation. And uh, inflammation is important for normal tissue healing, but it can also amplify or increase the amount of tissue damage. So it's a bit of a two-edged sword. And with chronic compression, there can be um, uh, infl inflammation that's occurring in the spinal cord. This can lead to pain, but it can also increase the amount of nerve cell injury that, that occurs. And so um, we're beginning to increasingly recognize this, and this is where some of the advances in research are beginning to have an impact on patient management. Uh, what is the research areas which are the most promising right now in treatment of uh, myelopathy? Right. So the, I would say if we look at the whole field of spinal cord injury, both traumatic injury and non-traumatic uh, uh, injury, um, I, I would um, kind of divide up the advances that have occurred as follows. So we've had dramatic advances in our ability to diagnose the problem. So CT scan and MRI scan have had a dramatic impact. We've had uh, advances in the um, non-operative management of, uh, of, of patients. So for example, there have been advances in the way EMS services, ambulance services, protocol, trauma patients, the way they're uh, brought into centers, and, and that's had a big impact on that. And then we've had advances in the general medical management, and we've had advances in rehabilitation. So the, all of these things have had important impact, and also prevention of injuries, seat belts, uh, safer workplaces, and so on and so forth. Now, in terms of the actual management, um, in spinal cord injury, one of the big advances that has occurred has been the role of early surgical decompression and reconstruction of the damaged spine. So there the spine is often fractured. It's unstable. There's pressure on the spinal cord. It used to be thought, like when I was a student, that it didn't really matter if you intervened or when you intervened because all the damage was done. We now recognize that's not the case. So the original uh, spinal cord injury is amplified 
by inflammation, by reduction of blood supply to the spinal cord. Secondary cascade. By the secondary cascade of injury. And so what uh, my colleagues and I uh, showed uh, a, a few years ago in a major multicenter clinical trial called the Staskis clinical trial, that early surgical intervention uh, involving decompression stabilization of the spinal cord had a very significant impact on improving the outcome of patients with spinal cord injury. And this has now become the standard of care around the world. So that's had a big impact in terms of changing the outcome for, uh, for patients. And then now patients um, have a better chance of taking advantage of advan advances in rehabilitation if people have more function. And one of the uh, things that you and I were talking about earlier was also the importance of small changes that occur. And so it used to be thought that, okay, well, you know, it's not going to be worthwhile to take something from the laboratory into the clinic unless it has a huge effect. We now recognize that that's not the correct thinking. So, for example, in, uh, in some patients who have a severe cervical spinal cord injury, if we can even get improvement in hand function, that has a big impact on people's quality of life. And so sometimes small things can really matter. Of course, we're always hoping to have the big impact. Breakthrough. But, but sometimes small things can have, can have an impact. And then at the basic science level, there are now advances that are occurring in biomolecular research that are starting to be translated into uh, the clinic. I'll give you a, a, f a couple of examples of these. So one example is with the repurposing of an existing drug, and the drug is called Riluzol. This is a drug that I had done research on and other scientists had done work on in the 1990s. And um, this drug blocks the abnormal um, entry of salts, such as sodium, into the nerve cell after injury. And it blocks um, an excitatory neurotransmitter called glutamate, which um, increases the amount of injury. And Riluzol subsequently has been used um, in the treatment of ALS. It's not a I cure mean, for ALS. Lateral sclerosis, yes. Lou Gehrig disease. Exactly. And it, it slows down the nerve cell degeneration. And what we had thought was, well, you know, could it have an impact in spinal cord injury, both traumatic spinal cord injury and non-traumatic spinal cord injury? And the basic science research has been extremely promising in this area. And we're now in the midst of two big clinical trials looking at people with a traumatic spinal cord injury where we're uh, doing decompressive surgery and then giving the drug to try to improve the outcomes. But we're also using this in people with degenerative cervical myelopathy. And so um, to uh, make the surgery even safer and, and also to improve the outcomes from the surgery. And we've just completed a big clinical trial in degenerative cervical myelopathy and we'll be analyzing the results over uh, the next couple of months and we'll be announcing those results later this year. So fingers crossed, but we're hopeful that that could represent an advance. So that's been one area. So that's been in the area that we call neuroprotective drugs. And really is always a particularly exciting advance that's occurred. Another big area is in the area of what we call regenerative medicine. Cell, stem cells. Stem cell therapies and bioengineered uh, strategies to potentially bridge the gaps in the spinal cord. Thank you very much. That was uh, Be Healthy, our program, with our guest, Dr. Michael Fellings, professor of neurosurgery, etc., etc., etc. Thank you. Thank you.